They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things. They willingly traded us everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and they do not know them for I showed them a sword and they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron, their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. These are the words of Christopher Columbus, written by his own hand about the people he encountered as a result of his famed voyages. Not the words of a brave hero or righteous explorer, but a merciless marauding tyrant. Rather than continuing the myths, the lies, and embellishments of this man, let's let his own words and the words of his contemporaries tell the real story. We will quote Columbus, cite historical accounts, and offer the observations of a bishop serving in the settlements established by Columbus. The expedition of Columbus was a failure. He did not reach the eastern regions of Asia. He did not chart a new maritime route for trade to the East Indies. Oh yeah, and the people he encountered on the islands he ran into were not Indians. He miscalculated the size of the planet by almost half. And it would be later European navigators who would establish that the land Columbus came upon was not actually Asia, but rather a vast populated world of islands and continents previously unknown to Europe. This failure had consequences, as did Columbus's reports back to the Spanish crown of an abundance of natives for slaves, rivers of gold, and a land of riches. There was actually very little gold and other riches that could be delivered to Spain for sponsoring Columbus's voyages, and certainly no access to trade with the East. Out of desperation, Columbus relied completely on slavery to justify his settlements and voyages. Indeed, these peaceful, generous people were subjugated and enslaved, and the cruelty is well documented. In Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, Zinn cites the journals of Columbus and others under his command, and the writings of Bartolome de las Casas, a former slave owner who became a priest and the Bishop of Chiapas. Las Casas wrote, such inhumanities and barbarism were committed in my sight as no ages can parallel. My eyes have seen these acts so foreign to human nature that I now tremble as I write. Columbus was greeted by the Arawak. They offered help to the voyagers, including food and hospitality. They farmed corn, yams, cassava, and cotton. They wove fabric but had no work animals or large land mammals for game. They had no iron, but some wore jewelry, including small amounts of gold. This would have devastating consequences. Las Casas wrote, endless testimonies proved the mild and pacific temperament of the natives, but our work was to exasperate, ravage, kill, mangle, and destroy. The Admiral, it is true, was blind as those that came after him and was so anxious to please the king that he committed irreparable crimes against the Indians. Native people were enslaved for service in their own homeland and others were shipped back to Spain. Thousands were gathered for the first transatlantic slave trade. Hundreds would die on each of these journeys while millions would die enslaved on their own lands. Las Casas documented these conditions he wrote of native people forced to work in gold mines to complete exhaustion and death. Those who opposed were beheaded or brutally disfigured. He wrote, they suffered and died in the mines and other labors in desperate silence, knowing not a soul in the world to whom they could run for help. In some provinces, all persons over the age of 14 had to fill a thimble with gold dust every three months. They would have copper shackles bound to their necks as proof of compliance. 
those who could not fulfill this obligation would have their hands cut off and strung around their necks while they bled to death. Over 10,000 died handless. But slavery was not limited to gold production. The rape culture of Europe had an immediate effect. One of Columbus's captains wrote, I captured a beautiful woman whom the Lord Admiral gave to me. And having taken her into my cabin, I conceived desire to take pleasure. But she did not want it and treated me with her fingernails in such a manner that I wished I had never begun. But seeing that, I took a rope and I thrashed her well. She raised such unheard of screams that you would not have believed your ears. Finally, we came to an agreement in such a manner that I can tell you that she seemed to have been brought up in a school of harlots. Sex slaves were not just a means to compensate his crew. Columbus shipped young girls back to Spain as well. Columbus wrote, a hundred Castellanos are easily obtained for a woman, and there are plenty of dealers who go about looking for girls. Those from nine to 10 are now in demand. Las Casas tells how the conceit of the Spaniards grew every day. Total control led to unimaginable cruelty and exploitation. Some refused to walk, forcing native people to carry them on their backs or in hammocks. Las Casas wrote, they had Indians carry large leaves to shade them from the sun and others to fan them with goose wings. The Spaniards, Las Casas wrote, thought nothing of knifing Indians by the tens or twenties and of cutting slices off them to test the sharpness of their blades. Columbus and the Spaniards brought war dogs to the Caribbean as weapons against the natives. In the early years of Columbus's reign, there were butcher shops throughout the islands where Indian bodies were sold as dog food. Live babies were fed to the war dogs for sport and for entertainment, sometimes in front of their horrified parents. In two years time, approximately 250,000 Indians were dead on Haiti. Many of these deaths included mass suicides or mothers killing their babies to avoid the horrors of a life and death of persecution. Bartolome de las Casas wrote, when he arrived in Hispaniola in 1508, there were 60,000 people living on the island, including the Indians. So that from 1494 to 1508, over 3 million people had perished from war, slavery, and the mines. He asked, who in future generations will believe this? I myself writing as a knowledgeable eyewitness can hardly believe it. Today, most Americans reject the truth of Columbus. They prefer the fairy tale version, the discovered America version. Italian Americans prop him up as their patron saint, falsely associating him with their own Italian heritage. His name is celebrated with holidays, in parades, as a name for cities, towns, and regions, including a province in Canada, the U.S. capital, and a country of South America. So what of Las Casas' question? Who in future generations will believe this? Will the truth prevail? Or will the myth of a fabricated hero continue? Mm -hmm.